Welcome back to the last technical session in the Writing Effective Conference Papers Workshop. Before we begin this particular session, I, I just want to address a few questions that have come up on the chat forum. I will take some now and some we can discuss after the session. For example, this is something I am going to state, yes, even yesterday people asked, will the presentation slides be available on Moodle? The answer is yes. If you ask me when, I would say the, my first answer would be very soon. I do not want to give an exact commitment, it could be as soon as tomorrow if everything is ok. But very soon all the slides will be available on Moodle. Secondly, uh, since this have to do with uh, the session on plagiarism, somebody has asked to please spend some time on self plagiarism. And what this means is, suppose you write an article for a conference and later you decide that well, you have done a little bit more work and you want to send a, you want to send a similar article with the extra work to a journal. How much extra work do you need to do before you send it to the journal? How different should be the second article that you send compared to the first article? This is something Professor Kannan spent some time on yesterday. He said that he, their group was writing a three part paper and they had to make sure that the three were sufficiently different from each other. So, all I can say here is that th there is no rule, rule that you have to have 30 percent more data or it has to be uh, 50 percent the size in terms of pa page length. There is no such hard and fast rule. You have to decide, you can decide that think critically as a scientist. Suppose for a conference you have done an experiment and you have generated a graph in some range of variables and let us say you have generated 8 data points. Later you, are, you go back to your lab and you find the ninth and 10th data point it seems to fit on the same graph. You will probably agree that this will not constitute a completely new paper. It is simply reconfirming the old results that you have already published in and reconfirming in a slightly larger range. On the other hand, suppose you find that the tenth point completely deviates from the pattern, you get curious about it and then you find that the next five points follow a very different pattern and some new uh, principle is being applied there or some new, new process is happening there. You may decide at that point that the new data points are sufficiently different in terms of principle or process compared to the original data in the first article that you submitted and you may decide to explore why something new is happening between the 10th and 15th data point. So, you have to think approach this problem from a scientist's point of view that is one point I would like to make. I think that is uh, all I would say about self plagiarism just a caution here please do not make what one of my colleagues calls delta x improvements. Okay, that is not good practice, it is not good etiquette and so on. There are several questions on uh, basic rules, how to's. For example, what should be the protocol for mentioning authors names or uh, how can plagiarism be automa um, automatically detected using software and so on. I am not going to spend time on that right now because these are short questions and uh, what I will do is reply to these answers on Moodle. What I do, what I would like to tell you is that most conference management systems have built in software where which can detect these plagiarized paragraphs. So, they do exist. In some ways, it is sufficient for us to know that they do exist because we are not going to indulge in that practice anyway, right. If you want to use the software for your students, that is a different issue. But again I would say I, I come from the philosophy that we have to treat this as an ethical practice that all of us follow and we make sure that our students also follow. So, let us talk about the right things to do, the right steps to take and just because we know that we will be caught that should not be the only reason why we should not do it. Is it ok if I communicate my article to one or to two or more journals at a time usually this is discouraged. So, you send it to one journal if they reject it, you can send it to the other, but doing it simultaneously to two is not a not an encouraged practice. While preparing a slide for a class, 
this is another question. I used to take, for example, Ohm's law statements from textbooks. Is this plagiarism? See, this would come under what we discussed yesterday about Newton's laws. If there is some knowledge which can be regarded as general scientific knowledge in the community, it is okay not to put a reference, it is okay not to cite. On the other hand, if the particular textbook is treating the material in a very unique manner, it is a good idea to cite the textbook when you are writing an article about that topic. If you are using slides for class, what I do is I usually give a list of references at the end for my students to go back and read from. So, there is something called fair uh, use for educational purposes. If you are only using slides for educational purposes in your classroom, which are never going to be published, you can do a lot more things. You, are, you have a lot more flexibility. You do not need to put citations everywhere, for example. But the moment the work is going to be published, you have to be careful. So, I am not talking about situations which come under fair use for educational purposes. I am talking about situations which come on uh, situations such as you are writing a paper, you have to borrow somebody else's ideas and what do you do. Okay, so, let us just start the session right now and before we start the actual session, I, I would like to spend some time on the goals of the session. So, what this is in a way applying practically what you have been hearing and practicing for the past day and a half or so. We would like to start from your idea and plan a research paper based on your idea. See, I use a word, a loose generic word called idea here and suddenly it is, you see the word research paper which you know is formal, it has all these guidelines and so on. And then first we will plan it and then I would like to organize, help you organize the paper into title, abstract and so on. This is very ambitious to do in one hour. So, I am not sure how far we will get along because I would like this session to be partially done by me and partially done by you. If you simply hear what I am saying, which you have been for the last day and a half, you are not going to be able to write the paper easily. So, in terms of the logistic co logistics of the session, what I will do is provide a template for planning your paper and lead you through the template slide by slide and step by step. This is what we were thinking of doing yesterday in activity 2, this might be similar to it. What you need to do is write answers to questions and I would like you to not simply think or talk about answers, you are you are free to talk about answers and of course, you have to think before you write, but I would like you to pick up a pen and write the answers in your notebook. Notebook is better than paper because it is going to stay with you. So, what you need as a paper pen and all your concentration because this is going to take some, not just some, but it is going to take significant effort from your side. So, those of you who are here, if you are, have a draft or an idea, please follow along. How to do this is going to start from the mini homework that was posed yesterday. Now, you see why this homework was posted. The homework was think of one innovative strategy teaching learning strategy that you may have used and write this idea in two or three sentences. If you have done the homework, great, that is where we will start from. If you have not done the homework so far, what I would request you to do in your own center is to find somebody who has done the homework and pair up with them. No more than groups of three, so find somebody who has done the homework if you have not yet done it. Shuffle around, just sit next to somebody because unless you start with this idea, the rest of the session is going to be useless. So, I am going to give you two minutes to actually find somebody in your center who has done the homework and whose idea that you like. If you have done the homework, please welcome other people into your group. You do not say that this is my idea, I am just going to stick to it. We are trying to also learn how to collaborate on scientific issues. Okay, two minutes, I am watching my clock, 30 seconds are done. Okay, what I request the remote center workshop coordinators to do is uh, to please help in reorganizing, just see who has done the homework, who has ideas. If you want, you can form groups and simply write the idea right now. I, we can take a couple of minutes to do that. I am going to assume that 
this is done and let us start with the actual template. So, the approach we are going to use is that we will start from your idea and then there will be a step by step guideline for each of these sections setup of the problem, explaining the solution and defending the solution and why these are required has been discussed in great detail yesterday and today morning and so on. I would like to note there is a fourth section which I have not mentioned here yet. I would like you to note that these sections are not necessarily the sections of your final paper. These are what you would need in order to write your paper. So, we are still at the planning stage. Once the plans are written down, then we will organize our paper that is going to be section 4 the, the, or the final section here. So, let us what you are supposed to do. Okay, the way this template works is there are three things instructions which are in white, examples which are in yellow which have been worked out for you and blank blue boxes. So, the moment you see a blank blue block blank blue box, it means that you have to write you have to do the work. The moment you see a yellow slide, it means there is an il illustrative example. So, read it and try to understand what is going on. So, that is the way we are going to work through the session. First part jot down your idea, jot down your ideas about the work that you already did. So, I am going to take a paper it is ok that you do not know the paper, because you will be able to follow along what the authors did. Here is the example and I will try to go in the order of instruction, example and then your work. The ideas that the author had had to do about distance education and interactivity. So, please read the slide. The central idea these authors had was that there is there is such a demand for distance education right now, but there is a big problem within the distance learning environment and interactivity could be a problem. Of course, there is interactivity like we are doing right now, but it is still not as easy to implement interactivity in a distance scenario compared to a face to face classroom. So, they looked at a technology called student response systems or clickers which already have been implemented in face to face settings and try to implement it within the distance environment. So, that was their idea. So, now your turn, jot down your ideas about the work that you have already done or some idea that you have. This is from yesterday's mini homework. What I do is I let me give you another two minute time to write this idea and just refine it, add two or three sentences if you would like. Again, Coordinators, if you have any questions as to what to do here, how the participants should participate, please uh, uh, ask your question through the chat window. I will try to try to lead you through it. Two minutes again. Let me interrupt here. There was an important chat question. Should this idea be about the paper that you read yesterday or should it be about your own idea? It should be about your own idea if it is not yet clear. So, we are now starting with your own idea and trying to develop it into a full fledged academic research paper. Yesterday we did analysis, we took existing papers and tried to determine identify the various features in it. Today we are doing the opposite or the synthesis part, we are starting with an idea and we are developing it into a paper. So, please start with your own idea here, this is not about something that already exists. Okay. Let us go on to the next section, but before that again I have a lot of questions on uh, is this activity going to be submitted etcetera. So, right now in this one hour I only would like you to write it in your notebook. At the end of the session I will discuss the homework which is going to be posted, it is a long homework, you will have about a week to do it where you have to submit it and so on. But in order to do the homework, you need to do some class work right now. Secondly, this idea should not be more than one slide. So, three sentences, four sentences are good, eight sentences are ok, but not three or four paragraphs. An idea is never that long. And I gave you some examples yesterday, for ex uh, let me try to recall them. We used Moodle in, a, in an innovative manner to implement a project based learning scenario with first year computer programming students, that is sufficient. I developed an, an architecture for a system that performs 
so and so educational purpose and so on. Okay. So, next part you have to now convert this to a problem. Why should we set up the problem? Why is not it sufficient to start with the idea? You remember what we talked about again for the past day and a half, you all these points are familiar to you. You may have done this work, but simply describing it is not a research article. At most, it might be a report. You have to situate the work in terms of its context, relevance, usefulness and rigor. You have to bring out all of these aspects going from idea to a research question, research problem. You need to th think about and determine, identify what other work has been done. That is why it is research. Again, this, this part we talked about yesterday, related work. Finally, the reason why you have to set up the problem is, if you do not sell your problem, nobody is going to buy your solution. Okay, so, set up of the problem is the first important thing you do. The first step we will take in setting up the problem is to determine what is the main concept underlying your work. What is the central idea, the key focus? We have used this phrase few times. What I would suggest is that you first illustrate the concept with an example and then you define it. See the example here. The key focus or the central concept underlying this work is improving interactivity in teaching in a distance mode. For example, in a face to face class, a teacher can ask a question and read the body language, I cannot do it right now with you. So, I am limited in terms of interactivity, but I can read the body language of people who are sitting here and it looks like there are some people who seem to be dozing off, which means I am speaking too much. There are some people who are nodding, there, most people are writing. Okay, so, these, this is an example of interactivity in teaching. Several kinds of interactivity could be possible, this is we are now going towards a formal definition. It has not yet been written, but we are going towards it. You can have a teacher student interactivity, student student, student instructional materials and so on, student and technology, there are several different kinds of interactivity. So, what I would like you to do at this point is illustrate the main concept underlying your work, give an example, just give an intuitive feel to the reader what you are talking about. And since you see a blue box, it means you have to write. Feel free to discuss with your colleagues and fellow participants. Okay, let us move on and if you feel that you do not have sufficient time to write this or if you need more time to think, you have a complete week to do so. So, the reason I am leading you through this step by step is so that you will be able to do the homework much more easily. You do not have to finish the activity today itself, but I want to get I want you to get an idea of what to do when you see this homework on Moodle. Next question is you have to answer why is your work important and you have to justify it. It is not sufficient to say I think this is important because it is not about your feelings, it is about why is it important for the given broad topic or within this community that is discussing this topic. Let us look at our example of distance education and interactivity. Many universities are starting distance education programs to address the problem of providing quality education at low cost. However, there is a problem. Student perceptions towards distance learning do not show a preference for these new modes. And this has been quoted, I forgot to put the citation here. What it means is, the person is using literature to show that students do not necessarily prefer distance learning compared to face to face learning. One reason why students prefer in class education is that there is more opportunity for interactivity in face to face classrooms and in distance education this opportunity is very limited. So, this paragraph, these two paragraphs show why the work of interactivity in distance education is important. It is because students want that, otherwise they are not going to come for the distance learning uh, scenarios. Your turn. Why is your work important? I am going to pause in between. Uh, what I do is, if you would like, I can just keep the earlier slide on, but if you do not hear me speak, it means it is your turn to write. 
let me ask a question here which uh, many of our students ask especially novice researchers they know that they have to just uh, they have to describe why the problem is important but they do not know how to go about answering this question so there are further hints what you can do is think about who requires your work who's the target audience or possible potential target audience for your work if we look at this example here about interactivity in distance learning the target audience for this work is every teacher or every university that is implementing a distance learning program once you think about who could be using your work or who could be requiring the results of your work it might help you write and articulate why your work is important you may need to read a little bit more or read from uh, relevant work to be able to answer this question but you can start by thinking who requires your work again today what i'd like you to do not today right now what i'd like you to do is just use your prior experience and intuition to answer these questions when you go back you can always look up or read some other paper and further strengthen the your answers let's look at the next question what prior work has been done for example the sub questions are are there any traditional ways commonly used traditional ways to solve your problem has anybody else attempted to solve your problem using a similar technique to yours so we are simply at this point listing prior work i'm not asking you to do anything more than look at find what else has been done in our problem context in the example we found the authors found that there was work related to improving interactivity in face to face classes using clickers lots of studies based on using the same technology but in a different scenario so that was one set of prior work the second set of prior work was work related to improving interactivity within distance education so to answer what are traditional ways to solve the problem and by the problem we are thinking about distance education and interactivity the answer is that well there is something called a mouse on every desk there's uh, there's something uh, th there is what we are doing two way interactiv interactivity using audio and video so these are traditional ways to solve the problem i am not going to ask you to fill this blue slide right now because you have to read in order to know what prior work has been done so i'll go to the next example next question and ask a similar question or pose a question about related work that the work that we just listed we have to analyze it we have to categorize it identify themes we could use figures and tables that's a great idea here we if you remember yesterday's activity in the afternoon one paper simply had a list of prior work the other paper categorized it into themes and the one that did the categorization was much easier to follow for example if you read this paragraph you will see that it's been categorized according to the theme of benefits and drawbacks there were two examples mentioned video and audio two way interactivity and a mouse on every desk so the theme the common categorization technique used was benefits and drawbacks similarly there was prior work of using clickers in classroom it was categorized on the basis of benefits effectiveness how do you find out what these themes are or what these categories are that's not there's no easy answer there but what i would suggest is again there are many tips and guidelines that you can follow suppose you have read 15 articles related to yours broadly related to yours put them in a spreadsheet this and you have to decide what should be the headings of the columns in your spreadsheet of course you're going to have column headings for authors and paper title and so on but is there anything else that you can categorize these according to for example you see that most of these papers have some mention of benefits and drawbacks so make a column called benefits make a column called draw drawbacks and then as you enter more and more rows each row is a new article fill in the entries under the column of benefits this is just one example one way to do it using a spreadsheet at this stage is a very uh, useful technique and many of our students have found it to be useful to be able to identify what themes otherwise you don't know where to begin do not read 100 papers and 
without starting to do any categorization. In fact, if you read two papers, that is sufficient to even begin your spreadsheet. And then you can read more papers and add more rows. Okay, let us go on. I think the next question you will understand, you will relate to and that is something you can perhaps think of writing. Once you have the related work, you have to further analyze it and figure out what are the gaps, the pain points, the problems that have not yet been addressed. For example, in current solutions aimed at improving interactivity in distance scenario, distance learning scenario, the instructor does not have sufficient means to gauge the comprehension of students in real time. This is what is happening right now. I can perhaps go to the user's window and let me see if I can view a video. I have to, no, I do not want to start interaction, I just want to see the video. Okay, so, I can see some student video here, some student video, some videos of the remote classrooms and what I see is that most people are listening. I, I, what I do not see is that people sitting and talking to each other. If my aim was that you talk to each other and work on this exercise, then I would have to take some real time action. This particular two way interactivity does have a feature, but it is still not as, it is not very satisfactory, that is a gap. A second gap is that if you have a distance scenario, sometimes students are in different locations, how can they talk to each other. So, how can Amrita Coimbatore for example, talk to St. Joseph's Kerala. Okay, so, these are gaps. There is one more important thing. Suppose you have an, suppose you find that nobody has used your specific idea so far, state it up front. You have to be careful here, because if somebody has done it and you say that nobody has done it, the referee will catch you. But if you really are sure that nobody has used your technique, state it. Okay, let us go to the next one. Uh, using your answers to questions 1, 2, 3 and 4, you can start writing your problem. Question 1 was, what is the main underlying concept? Question 2 was, what is related work? I think that was question 3, let us see. Uh, question 2 was, why is your work important? Question 3 was, what is related work? And question 4 uh, it was, what are gaps in related work? Use those 4 questions or use the answers that you have written to those 4 questions to write your problem. Here, the authors say, have written a problem which says, what is the procedure by which one can embrace implementation and benefits of clickers for distance education? If you notice, they have split their question into two levels, a broad level question and specific questions. When they do experiments or when they do their proofs, they are initially going to be answering specific questions. From the answers to specific questions, they may answer the broad level question. It is very hard to answer broad questions directly, but you do need it to make sense of your work. This is a place where I think I would like to I would like you to take a couple of minutes and actually try to work on this. You have an idea so far, how can you phrase it as a problem? Just do this exercise. What you should uh, note is that try to write these problems as questions. It is going to help you a lot later and it is also going to help the reader. Again at this point, I, I just want you to talk to each other a little bit, get some intuitive sense and you will have time later during the week to work on this on your own. The whole point of this section is that by now, if you have filled out all these slides, if you know the answers and if you have written the answers to all these slides and let us say you have translated it into your paper, the reader will be convinced that your problem is important and possibly your technique might be interesting. That is what you achieve by answering these questions. So, we are taking an idea and we are uh, going from the idea to make, to organizing the paper itself. Next set of 
guidelines. You've set up the problem, people are happy, now you have to explain your solution. We talked about this a lot yesterday. What's your solution approach? Describe your overall approach. And here, what you want to do is describe what possible details you will include. You don't have to include the details here itself. For example, the instructor in our distance learning example, the overall approach was that the instructor delivered lectures from a central location, like we are doing just now, and they transmitted to remote classrooms. Participants in the remote classrooms have the technology, the receivers and the transmitters, etc. They respond to questions posed by the instructor using clickers. Okay, this is the overall solution. What you need to do in your final paper is show a block diagram, show the architecture. You also can show a flow diagram of the process and so on. So simply say, I will show this in my paper. If you notice something, all the answers to these slides fit in a single slide. So you have to think about what you will write. This is not about writing three or four paragraphs. It's about thinking the key idea and putting it in two or three sentences on a single slide. Again, this is a place where I would like you to spend a few minutes thinking. Again, if you have questions, do pose it through the chat forum. Let me try to look at some of the videos and see what you're doing. It's good to see that in some of the classrooms, I do see some of you talking and working with each other. Once you finish describing your overall solution approach, what you have to argue is why is your method likely to work? Is it sound? Is it sufficient? You also have to talk about why your method may not work. So you have to think about the limitations and the assumptions and the scope and so on. So in our distance education scenario that we've been talking so far, we made assumptions that the participants actually use the clickers. If that assumption fails, it means even though we have all this great technology, we cannot improve the interactivity problem. So there you have to identify what is the actual assumption. And if it's invalid, you have to try to address the problem. So for example, one thing that the authors found was that there were, a lot, there were a lot of technical glitches that were arising in the remote centers, because of which people were not using the clickers. So they had to send manpower from their end to the remote centers to solve this problem, and so on. Again, do a consistency check at this point. Check that the solution is actually addressing the problem. By now, what you've done is set up the problem and told the reader what the solution is going to be about. So you do the what first, and then you do the why. You help the reader understand why he or she should believe you, which means this is the part which is not going to be very hard for you, because this is the heart of the work that you have done. You have to think of what evidence you will provide. It could be results of an experiment. It could be an analysis. It could be a proof, and so on. Somebody asked me earlier in the chat window whether an experiment is necessary. And no, it's not. It depends on the kind of problem you're solving. Perhaps you're doing a problem where a proof is necessary, or maybe only an analysis is necessary. You have to decide what kind of evidence is important for your problem, and you have to provide that evidence. You also have to provide how you generated that evidence. This is, this is important in science, because if somebody wanted to repeat your analysis or your experiment, they should be able to do so. So the distance clicker authors collected data. They tell you what kind of data, how many days worth of data, and how they analyzed it. Again, as I said, this is the part which most papers get. They're OK, because this is their work. I have put a star here, because I know this is something you won't be able to do sitting in a classroom. But you can think about it later. This is also a place, after this, you have to think about the results. And you have to decide what format you will report your results. Professor Gaitonde did, did a whole section session on this yesterday. So that's where you will use how to report your results. So far, we have planned the paper, or we have at least talked about planning the paper, because you cannot plan it in half an hour. 
but at least we have discussed it. Next comes organizing the paper and here there were a number of questions yesterday about title and format and so on, uh, abstract and introduction, let us look at it. The first thing you have to think about here is what are the key concepts. I would like you to work on this a little bit. So, pick up, if you, if you do not want to do this exercise for the new idea, think about anything you have written so far and identify what key knowledge your paper is contributing. And as we have repeated several times, it is not simply a report, what you really have to think about is the points you want to highlight, one or two or three maybe maximum, not everything. So, two minutes for you to write down your key contributions. This is an, this is I would say the one of the most important slides to organize your paper because your title will depend on it, your introduction will depend on it, your abstract will depend on it. Once you get this slide, it is also difficult to write. Once you are able to answer this, your title and abstract and intro become much easier. So, spend some time on this slide just now. As uh, some, of, some of you requested, you wanted to see the yellow slide even when you were doing work. So, I am going to leave the yellow slide, but I am going to give you about a few minutes to work on this. I am assuming that you have thought about this a little bit and have been able to write some part of this, because if you have done this, all your questions from yesterday will become easy to answer. What is the title? Several of you asked this yesterday, we tried to answer it. Let us see how to do it. As some of you mentioned, it is not a good idea to pick any title. What the, the hints that help you pick a good title are, or they come from the previous slide of the key contributions. Capture the aspects that you want to highlight that you have already written in the slide of key contributions. Then come up with three or four options. Some may be too broad, some may be too specific, some may be long, some may be attractive, it does not matter at this stage. Simply write down various options for the titles, but try to make sure that they all capture your key contributions. I will show you an example in a moment. So, let us look at the key contributions from uh, the distance learning paper. There were two key contributions the authors thought they, uh, which they mentioned. We provide the architecture of implementing a distributed student response system, which is another name for clicker. They develop and provide the architecture, that is one contribution. And the second contribution is the pedagogical process of using clickers in a distributed distance learning environment. Using these two contributions, they came up with four titles. The first one, using clickers in distance education. First, they simply came up with the titles. So, let us analyze them. This is too broad. It is still not too bad because clickers and distance education has not been done so far or at least it had not been done then. So, it was not such a bad title, yet it is a little too broad. The next possibility falls on the other end of the spectrum. Design of an open source student response system based on some particular architecture for a distributed setup in distance education. In fact, one of you mentioned this scenario exactly in the chat session yesterday. The problem here is that there are too many details and the key contribution is not clear. So, this one we are going to throw away immediately. Next title says design and deployment of clickers in a distance education scenario. It is slightly better than the first one, because it means that the authors have designed and they have used. It also gives the reader an idea that there is something original happening in the design and it is that original design which has been used. So, this is at the right level, it does capture key contributions. The fourth one is very attractive. It says clicking away the distance from education. It is a cute attractive title. However, sometimes you have to be wary of writing something too cute, because finally it is a professional forum. And I should mention at this point that this paper has been published on, under this final title. So, 
So, the authors decided to go with the cute title. It is not a right or wrong choice, it is just something you have to be aware of. How attractive should you make it versus how professional? Second and 2 and 4 are again on opposite ends of the spectrum. 2 has all the details, it is highly technical, but it is very dry. 4 has no details, but it is attractive. So, here is how you go from the key contributions to coming up with something with a title, with firstly a set of titles and use the analyses that you do later to pick one or the other. After you write your key contributions in your homework, you can work on this exercise. Okay, next thing, after title comes the abstract, how to write the abstract. Here you have to revisit all the slides that you have written so far. Section 1, set up of problems, section 2, explain solutions, Sex, section 3, defend solution. Importantly, revisit the key contribution slide. Now, you have to make choices. The first sentence here, decide what are crucial points is what you have to be doing, but that is a difficult thing to do. You have to decide what is crucial and what can be left out. Some hints, further hints. The central problem is usually crucial. Unless somebody knows what the problem is, they won't, the solution won't make sense. If you have done anything new, it is crucial. If you have absolutely great results, you should include them in the abstract, a single sentence. I do not mean a data table or a figure, but if you find that your method caused the students to perform three times better than the traditional method, do state it. A threefold improvement in anything is huge, so you have to state it. So, decide what are the crucial points after revisiting the slides you have written so far and after you have written the key contributions. The abstract must include your con contributions again. It should not be too broad and too generic like Professor Kannan Madhgalia explained yesterday. How much of these details to include really depends on abstract length. It can be the same details, but you can have, uh, it can be the same crucial points, but it can have, you can say it precisely or you can put more details. So, let us look at an example. You remember the title and the key contributions here, I am just flashing this to remind you again. This has been converted into an abstract here. This abstract is only 60 words long, Sometimes it, it could have been even cut to 50. In some cases, people ask for 50 word abstracts, but importantly, it has only four sentences, yet it covers all of this and it also takes care of everything that you did in the first, everything you saw in the first three sections. If your conference asks for, typically conference abstracts are uh, 150 or 200 or 300 words long, they do not, sometimes people tell you how, how long they want it to be, sometimes they may not but 200 is a very typical abstract length. You simply take these ideas and you write 200 words, which is 12 sentences or so, 12 to 15 sentences or you can take a short abstract and expand it. You might decide to put in a few more details of the solution. You might explain some of the challenges you faced. You can put in some details of the actual architecture if you have 200 words. And as some of you were asking me yesterday, what to do if you have to submit an extended abstract? Go back to this slide and see what are the, and then go back to this slide and decide what are the crucial points first and then write your abstract. So, there is no qualitative difference in an abstract whether it is 50 words or 200 or one page because the principles that you follow are here. Okay, next we come to introduction. Professor Kannan spoke a lot about this yesterday, brief and complete. How is that possible? You have set up your problem, you have written all the slides so far on set up problem, explain solution and defend solution. You also know the key contributions. So, simply write a few sentences about all of those. How long? Again, it depends, maybe as short as one paragraph, maybe one page. It may be one page because you might have to spend a lot of time discussing why the problem is important, the slide 2 that you talked about. Again, the 
planning slides are the ones that you're going to use. Once you have written down what, once you have identified which ones you're going to include, just make sure that the points in your introduction have a flow. That's why we said right at the beginning that the planning section was not going to give you the order. It was just going to give you the main points, the content. Then you decide what are the other sections. Simply go back to, to all the slides that you've written so far and decide what, where you'll break up your flow. What are the sections? What are the titles of the sections, subsections, and so on? You don't have to write too many new things yet uh, at this point because hopefully you've already done the work. And on the other hand, what you're doing here is taking what you've done and organizing it, sequencing it, giving it titles and so on. With that, you're done with your paper. Let me take a question that's there in the chat window and then we'll, uh, then I'll tell you what we'll do for the next, uh, in the next few minutes. Somebody has asked, should the objective of research work be mentioned in the abstract or introduction or both? Now, I believe what you mean by objective is captured in two things. It's captured in the contributions because the contribute, it's partially captured in the contributions, it's captured a lot in the research questions, the problem itself. So the objective has to come out in the problem. So yes, the objective of the research work should be mentioned fairly strongly in the abstract and also in the introduction, but you can state it as the problem. Okay, what next? You've planned your paper, you've organized it, now you have to actually write it. Here is where all the good practices that Professor Fatak talked about yesterday come in handy. I have only been able to capture some of them here. I think this is something that wasn't mentioned yesterday, but you have, no, I, he did mention it, right? Yes, good. So he's done all the work for us. Read. The more you read, the easier it will be for you to write. Write a first draft, it doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter. At this point, you're not thinking of producing the best draft or even a good draft, but write a draft based on this template, these slides you've created so far. I'm, I'm simply reiterating what Professor Fatak said. Iterate and improve. Use all the guidelines you've learned in the past day and a half. Give your draft to a colleague. Ask them to check. But when you give it to them, you have to ask them, you have to specifically ask them what you want from them. If you simply give a draft to a colleague, perhaps they'll correct your grammar and give it back. And maybe what you were more interested in was the flow. Or maybe you've, you're sure of the flow, you don't want to change it anymore because you've done nine drafts and you want somebody to do a last quick check to make sure that there is no grammatical mistake. So ask your colleague, request them to read it, but tell them what you want from them. And again, your colleague is only going to be reading, or they'll only be willing to read maybe one or two drafts, unless you have colleagues who like you very much. So use them, use their help carefully. Don't give the same draft to the same colleague multiple times. They're valuable resources for you. I'll talk about the second one first. The slides that we just discussed, complete the slides in the template. I'll upload a slightly new revised version of the template. Complete them, write them, upload them on Moodle. Only the slides and only one slide per question. No three or four paragraphs, no first drafts and so on. Only the slides, one slide per question. Once the slides are uploaded, you can comment upon the outline of your fellow participants. So we are going to use Moodle to, in fact, collaboratively generate and revise and improve our work. The last point is something I will try to do. If you are able to upload a completed outline, say, by next Sunday, and if it adheres to all the guidelines, that is, only one slide per question and so on, I will try to request our TAs here, the project staff and the ETPHD students 
to go through some of these slides and give comments. Again, if you have not adhered to the guidelines, it will be hard to do so. So, this is one of the homework that will be posted on Moodle. The second thing you can do is, remember a lot of you uploaded a first draft. In fact, we were thrilled here to re receive almost 450 first drafts, the pre-workshop assignment. Use this template to reverse engineer that draft. This is only a self-assessment exercise. You do not have to submit anything here. Take the draft that you uploaded and then fill out this template based on that idea, that paper. Check if all the important characteristics are present. Check if you followed all the guidelines and do this exercise only for self-assessment, but this exercise will also help you improve your draft. So, essentially take the existing paper you have, convert it to the template. That is this homework. The next homework is the reverse. Take an idea for and then convert it to the template. Okay, that brings us to the end of the session.